Well, we're off to a really good new year, although I have to say I'm feeling a little paranoid after that children's story. Um, I think Liz has been following me, and that that was a parody of... Uh, uh, I only drink coffee on those mornings that I get up. So... Uh, no, we've had a fun worship service so far, hasn't it been? Amen. Great New Year, an opportunity to celebrate and enjoy life and, and God, and God's presence, and God's goodness. For those of you who were able to be with us last night, uh, we welcomed in a new year and a new Sabbath, and uh, what a joy that was. Next time we do a Vespers that Paul is organizing, I think you're going to want to be there. And if you're going to show her love, you may not think of it this way, but if you're going to show Paula love, sign up. There's an event coming the 24th. It's called our, I can never remember the name, the rotating dinner, progressive dinner. There, I remembered. How about that? Progressive dinner. I think she probably has sign-up sheets for that. Show Paula you love her and sign up. Don't think of it as some way of obligating yourself necessarily or an inconvenience or something. Don't be, don't be afraid to put your name on. Uh, it, just, just put your name down and, and come, and that'll show love to Paula. But anyway, despite the, the two people who signed up for last night and the 35 people who came, we had a great time. We had a great time. Breakfast for supper, uh, you, you're going to want to try that. Maybe tonight, waffles, I don't know, something, pancakes, uh, we had a good time. And then uh, music. Thank you, Lee. Thank you for that. Uh, Chris and Pete. And that was fun. And uh, a little a little thought from me. And some of the stuff that was in last night's thought might actually make its way into today's talk as well. So forgive the, the duplication. I was visiting with Peter, and he was reflecting on his feelings about New Year's resolutions, which came through in some of Liz's uh, ideas today, and I share them. They're set up for failure. Uh, I say I'm going to lose 20 pounds, and I never do. Well, I do, but then maybe I gain back 13 or 25. Um, and so New Year's resolutions are really tough. When we think to ourselves, I'm going to be more this or more that or do this differently or do that, it's not always that helpful for a variety of reasons. First of all, this whole thing with New Year's is sort of arbitrary, isn't it? You know, uh, a day feels much longer uh, up north part of the year and much shorter up north than it does at the equator or, or south. That's, that's the rel relativity of the day on earth, and yet it's 24 hours that we mark as a day. It's, it's kind of set, kind of kind of what we do. So we have, we have these pieces with the cycles of things that we identify as a year, and that may be meaningful in terms of planetary movement, and it may be meaningful in, in some scientific or time terms, but even our calendar has to be adjusted every now and then. It's not absolutely precise. And I'm never really new. I'm both new all the time, and I'm never really new. I'm a continuity of being from birth to now. Hard to believe, but it's true. And every 10 years, yes, all the cells in my body, except for brain cells, have replaced themselves. So um, I'm sort of new on a 10-year cycle. But I am really, in essence, the same person that I was on December 30 and December 31, right here at January 10. There, there, there's just not a whole lot that's different about my temperament, my personality, my tastes, my drives, my desires, my interests, my passions, my mentality, my mental capabilities. There's just not much of a shift. I am kind of this ongoing creature, and so are you. And so the idea that somehow a new year can come and everything is going to be new for me now this new year has a sort of disconnect that we, I think, experience. There's also a lot of uh, celebration about what's past. And maybe we're celebrating it because we're, it was so bad, we're glad it's gone. And maybe we're celebrating it because it was so good and we got so many things accomplished that it's actually worth noting or remembering. But we think about 
the future a lot when it comes to the new year. This is the year of promise, and that whole idea takes us forward in the future. I'm going to come back to this idea of past, present, future, and time in just a little bit. There are some things I think that are worthwhile. Some of you may be very aware of the sort of painful truth of Ryan Bell's experiment. Ryan is Bev's stepson and Rick's son. He's a former pastor in the Adventist church, has been with the church a number of years. I think he, he says 19 uh, with the Seventh-day Adventist church. Last year, he announced that he was going to take a year without God. No prayer, no Bible reading, no spiritual exercises, no, no thinking per se about God. Instead, he was going to spend time reading about the atheist positions and arguments and studying those and making a deliberate choice to live his year outside of the presence of God. A lot of people were shocked by that, and it certainly cost him something, uh, already by that time, he, he was no longer an employee of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but he lost his employment at uh, Azusa Pacific, where he had been doing some teaching, and Fuller Theological Seminary, where he had been doing some teaching. If you know Ryan or you've met him, he's a wonderfully articulate, brilliant guy, and people talk about him all over the United States. So I finally decided, instead of just being quiet and pretending that I don't know this thing has happened and that you don't know this thing has happened, I'm just going to talk about it a little bit. So here we have this Seventh-day Adventist person we're connected to who's made this choice to live a year with God, out God and recently announced that he's decided there is no God. And so this is, this is part of the pain that goes with us into the new year as a congregation, whether we know it or not. Now, I want to propose something a little different. I want to propose that we live a year with God. Now, I'm not being flippant, and I'm not being a smart aleck where Ryan is concerned. The truth is, as Ryan expressed it so articulately, we all struggle at times with doubts. We can all formulate things or come to things where we think, I wonder why God didn't do something differently in this instance. Or maybe God wasn't there for me in this instance. We're all capable of, of thinking those kinds of thoughts, asking those kinds of questions, and cultivating those kinds of doubts. And moreover, functionally, many times we live as if we don't believe. We, we live functionally as atheists. We go through a day without a thought of God. We go through a day without connecting to God in any kind of purposeful or intentional way. We go throughout a day without thinking of something to be uh, praising him for. We go throughout a day without seeking his wisdom, his spirit, his counsel, his guidance, his presence. We're very independent sometimes in our thinking and being. We get very busy and it's up and shower and something to eat on the way out the door. Or as Liz so aptly illustrated, cutting the kid off in Starbucks to get to the coffee and getting onto our jobs and and making our lives work in some kind of way. We're very good at getting to work and then focusing in on what we've got to do and talking about the office news or whatever the story is and lunch break and off with somebody else and then back home and you've got to stop by the dry cleaner in the grocery store and you've got to make dinner and then there's uh, that episode of some show you had to see and by then you're exhausted and it's off to bed. A day without God. And a day without God becomes a week without God, and a week without God becomes a month without God, and a week without a month without God becomes a year without God. We're very good at living functionally as if we don't believe. So I'm not being flippant. I'm suggesting that we don't make New Year's resolutions per se. We don't say, I'm going to do this or do this and set ourselves up for failure. But we ask ourselves, what would a better version of us look like in the new year? How might life be different? And I would suggest to you this morning that the primary way you can make your life different in a way that matters is to live the year with God. Amen. Let's take a look at a couple of our texts and see if they can give us some input and guidance. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, time and uh, 
it'll be time to, to do the next thing in our day. So stay with me. I have a penchant sometimes for doing things in uh, the order in which they come, and so I will follow that. We're going to go to Isaiah 42. Now I see it listed as, I'm, I'm sorry, call to worship, Isaiah 42, 1 to 10. We're familiar with this passage because it's read around the Christmas holidays. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. Who is this talking about? Jesus, Jesus, isn't it? We use Isaiah 42 as one of the prophecies about Jesus. We see in this a fulfillment that he brings to these words. And in Jesus own words many times he refers to prophecy and says this is to fulfill or the gospel writers say this was to fulfill what was written in the prophet Isaiah as we read forth it says he will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets no John the Baptist will be the one calling forth the way of the Lord a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out you see, he comes in gentleness with a spirit of grace and love and care. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged. Justice is going to reign as he establishes it on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. Now, there are several commentaries that talk about this and they differ on the interpretation. I encourage you to go home and see if you can figure out what islands means. This is what the Lord says, the creator of heavens who stretched them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. We have God identifying himself as creator as ground of being, as the source of all life and the source of your life. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. To open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Here again, we have a recapitulation of a theme. There's a social justice that comes from those who are in covenant relationship with God and who are connected to him because he's the God of creation and justice. But there's also a spiritual awareness that's coming in this passage. We see the world differently because of our context as those who have been made by him, called to righteousness in him, held by him, and made a covenant. I am the Lord, he says, this is my name. I am that ground of being. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. And here he speaks of time. The former things have taken place. Past. What's gone on before. The former things have taken place. And new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Here is the word of the Lord. Now I've made this point to you before. This illustrates it again. If you haven't heard it before, maybe you hear it now. God's word is generative. What I mean by that is when he speaks, things happen or come to be. So when God speaks something, that word is not just empty. That word is productive. That word creates. This is why we read in Genesis, he spoke and it was, you see. Now we can get into the whole ex nihilo arguments and all those sorts of pieces, but what I'm really trying to get at is a more poetic reading. I want you to hear the way in which when God speaks, it's not emptiness, it's not void, it's productive. It brings something into being. And so we have what's behind us. We have this continuity of being, this thing that we have been, this thing that we are behind us. And now when God word, God's word comes to us, with it comes newness, for he is doing a new thing. He is making a new creation. Did that communicate clearly, or do I need to go over that again? 
I'm not trying to beat a drum. I'm trying to help you hear in Isaiah these words. And new things I declare before they spring into being, I announce them to you. God even tells us that the new things are happening. There's a prophetic element to this. And so we end in praise. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that it is in it, you islands and all you who live in them. Not just the land masses, but the seas and the islands. Let everything praise the Lord. Sing to him a new song. There's a, there are a whole church, well, they're not denominations, but there's a whole collection of evangelical churches called New Song based on this passage. You see, God says, I will do a new thing, and he's doing it, and in response, we're to sing a new song. What does that mean? His deeds are new every morning, and our praise is fresh every morning. That doesn't take us to a future, it takes us to a present. And so that's a very wonderful sort of reality that we can step into. Our Old Testament reading was found in Isaiah 43, 18, and 19. Here's our relationship to time and the new year and, and why it is that we ought to think on these things. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Now, as my wife can tell you, I'm an archivist and historian and not a very well-organized one. I have boxes and boxes and boxes of photos and memorabilia. And every time we move, I pay a price for having those things because I hear about when is that going to get organized? When is that going to get culled down a little bit? Um, do you really need that picture that you drew in third grade kind of thing? The answer, of course, is absolutely. Um, <laughs> but I love Jill's impulse here because she doesn't want to see us become a feature in these hoarders um, <laughs> television shows. She really wants to make sure that we have a life of, of uh, more beauty and order than that, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. But forget the former things. So what does this mean when it says forget the former things? It, it doesn't mean that we forget our continuity of being. It doesn't mean that we don't have some sort of personal and collective memory. It doesn't mean that it might not be appropriate for us to take a few artifacts or curate a few artifacts of that along the way. After all, we sing this song, Here I raise my Ebenezer. There's an altar that we erect in order that we might remember where God has been and what God has done. So this is not inappropriate to the human experience. This is appropriate to the human experience. Why does he say forget the past? Because the past is only in an encapsulation of a reality that is now stilled. It's no longer dynamic. It's happened, it's done. You can't relive it. You can't change it. You can't make it different or better. All the interesting time travel shows aside. I know that sometimes we wish we could. I remember being a teenager, and I was reading C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters, not this particular edition, and I was just stunned because he talked about time in a way that I had been thinking about but couldn't articulate. If you've read the screw tape letters, you know that C.S. Lewis writes them from the perspective of an imp or an angel of darkness. And when he refers to the enemy, he's actually referring to Christ and God. And so it's written from the perspective of how to help or make sure that human beings fall and don't ever connect with the divine, with their God, with their creator, with their savior. So it's a very interesting sort of book looking at uh, things from the dark side. Very helpful, actually. So here is a Wormwood and his uncle having a conversation about how to trap and ruin humans. And they have quite a philosophy they discuss in the meantime. Here's what it says in letter 15. The humans live in time, but our enemy destines them to eternity. Now let me just make sure you're following me. When C.S. Lewis in this prose says the enemy destines them to eternity, he means humans live in time, but God destines them to eternity. 
God, therefore, I believe, wants them to attend chiefly to two things, to eternity itself and to that point of time which they call the present. For the present is the point at which time touches eternity. Couldn't have said it better myself. Of the present moment, and of it only, humans have an experience analogous to the experience which our enemy has of reality as a whole. In it alone, freedom and actuality are offered them. He would therefore have them continually concerned either with eternity, which means being concerned with him, or with the present, either mediating, or excuse me, meditating on their eternal union with or separation from himself, or else obeying the present voice of conscience, bearing the present cross, receiving the present grace, giving thanks for the present pleasure. Our business is to get them away from the eternal and from the present. And he goes on to describe so many interesting things. He says, to be sure, the enemy wants men to think of the future too, just so much as it is necessary for now planning the acts of justice or charity which will probably be their duty tomorrow. The duty of planning the morrow's work is today's duty, though its material is borrowed from the future. The duty, like all duties, is in the present. The future, he says, is the least like reality. And in the future, here's what he says, in a word, the future is of all things the least like eternity. It is the most completely temporal part of time for the past is frozen and no longer flows. The present is all lit up with eternal rays. Hence the encouragement we have given to all those schemes of thought such as creative evolution, scientific humanism, or communism, which fix men's affections on the future on the very core of temporality. Hence, nearly all vices are rooted in the future. Gratitude looks to the past and love to the present, but fear, avarice, lust, and ambition look ahead. Forget the former things, the passage says. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you hear the word? C.S. Lewis is right. It is in the present that we experience this newness and this grace. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness. Remember we talked during Advent season about a highway for our God? and streams in the wasteland, even water that brings life to a desert. Maybe here, in this passage, we get a glimpse of how we might move toward a better version of ourselves and how we might live in this next year with God. Our New Testament reading was taken from 2 Corinthians and said simply this, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has already come. The old is gone, and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This isn't a resolution. This is a daily choice. This ministry that God does and that we participate in in life together is the choice. If we are in him, if we are in him, we're a new creation. Now, you may just think, that how on earth can I be in him? Let's just break that down very quickly. First of all, we know from Scripture that we were created by him in his image, male and female. So we're image bearers. We know from Scripture that He is the ground of all being. He is the I am, existence itself. And we know in in Acts 17 that He is the ground of our being. We know that we have a choice to live with, in cooperation with, or in opposition to. And so how is it that we make that choice 
John 15 describes it as something as natural and organic and unthought through as a branch that's connected to a vine. The branch doesn't think about producing fruit, it just does. The vine wells up for nutrients from the ground and water from the ground, the sunshine shines, and God has placed within that vine the biotic mechanisms for self-reproduction. The grapes grow, the seeds within the grapes fall upon the earth and new vines are formed. The grape is the fruit, it's the harvest. Jesus says, as long as you're living, as long as you're connected to me, you're alive. And as long as you're in me, a new thing is happening. That's our new year. The new year has significance not because I'm going to lose whatever weight I hope to lose or because I'm going to be more patient or I'm not going to wear my pajamas to church. Although, frankly, if I had footed pajamas, who knows? The, the, the question is, how do I, as a, out of a continuity of being, out of being kind of the same person, how do I be different? How can anything really be new? And the scripture has our answer for us because every day I commit to being in Christ, I am a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And now what determines where I go is not me, but life by some kind of spirit. And this is where we get to our gospel reading, where Luke 5 helps us very much understand how this might function in our reality. He tells a parable, Jesus does. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Well, that for obvious reasons. Why wreck the new one to fix the old, first of all? And secondly, then he goes on to a practical piece. Not only have they torn the new garment, but the patch from the new will not match the old. They shrink at different rates. And the old, the new patch will shrink and tear an even bigger hole in the old garment. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the new wineskins will burst the skins. Excuse me, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. Common sense of the day. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. So the new things God wants to do They don't belong in our old matrix. They don't belong in the old fabric, in the old wineskin. They belong in a new way of being. And so what is new we receive as new from God as we live in him. What I'm getting at is what I started with. The project for the year, if we're going to be different, if anything is going to change, if we're going to experience newness in the most positive and fulfilling and meaningful and hopeful and beneficial way is to live our year with God. To be in Christ, the new creation. This is the essence. What does a better version of you look like? What does that better version look like in Christ?